If you somehow managed to survive a series of increasingly difficult and dangerous death games, only to be forced into surviving yet another series of increasingly difficult and dangerous death games, what would you do? With only 12 challenges remaining, we're on the home stretch, but you know the shadowy lunatics running this asylum saved their best for last. Not only are these challenges even deadlier than before, each one pits us directly against its creator, meaning we'll have to learn fast and think outside the box's box if we want any chance of making it out alive. Oh, and just for fun, one of them is pretty much just a heavily armed psychopath hunting us down between matches, so there's that. I'm gonna break down the mistakes made, what you should do, and how to beat every death game in Alice in Borderland Season 2. It's been days since Erisu was yoinked from his reality and forced to fight for his life in Borderland, and things just keep going from bad to worse. After losing his lifelong friends in a bout of high stakes hide and seek, he wound up getting forced into a gang of violent beach bums that were more concerned with killing their fellow players than actually finding a way out of this nightmare. For a minute, it seemed like they might be able to earn their ticket home by collecting all 40 numbered cards associated with each trial. But come on, why the hell would someone go through all the trouble of organizing their death games like Solitaire without including the face cards? Which brings us to where we are now. With the last of the numbered games leaving their home base in smoldering ruins, Erisu and the remaining Beach Boys gather in the city center after seeing signs the next phase is about to begin. Chief among them, the massive blimps with face card banners floating just overhead. Right, here's the thing. <laughs> Alright, things starting off with a bang. Are you hooked yet? Evidently, this next batch of challenges isn't as concerned with player consent. Either that, or one of their fellow contestants has finally had enough. Whatever it is, we're still dead if we don't find a way out of this shooting gallery fast. We can see from the muzzle flashes that the trigger man is posted up just below that H&M sign, and we'll want to run perpendicular to his line of sight to make ourselves as difficult to hit as possible, not straight away from him like these two morons. He's using some kind of anti material rifle. Definitely semi-auto based on the timing of these shots. My money's on it being a Barrett M82 or M107 chambered in 50 Browning machine gun, as those are pretty much the pumpkin spice latte of big bore rifles these days. A quality muzzle break along with the rifle's immense weight will cut down on the felt recoil considerably, but the sheer amount of muzzle blast will make rapid follow-up shots difficult. Because of this, we should time our movements with each flash, running to cover as quickly as possible. Buildings like this one, Arasu and friends find will offer some degree of cover and concealment, provided you're smart enough to actually duck your head below the windows. However, cars will also work as long as we can get behind the engine block. I recognize that sound. Now we've got an assault rifle. Of course, once he transitions to his AR, things become a totally different ball game, since it seems literally no one actually bothered to bring any firearms from the beach resort. Our best option is still to break line of sight as quickly as possible, except now we have to worry about him coming after us on foot. The good news is that a massive tidal wave of nobodies just spawned in to help pad out the kill counter without sacrificing anyone we care about. Unless he's targeting us specifically, this nutjob's priority will be stacking as many bodies as possible so our best bet is to split off from the herd and leave him to it. Likewise, we'll also want to exercise a little social distancing within our own group to look less like a rolling overkill. Have you looked in a mirror? You don't have the excuse of barely surviving multiple death games. You just lack basic hygiene and self-care. It's okay, there's a cure. Geology. No, I'm not talking about sedimentary layers. Geology, like layers of your skin. Geology is a six-time award-winning skin, hair, and body care company recognized in men's Health, Hype Beast, Birdie, Esquire, and Ask Men Grooming Awards with over 6,000 five-star reviews. Look, I get it. I used to use bath soap for my body, face, and hair. Works in your 20s, but you start seeing the damage in your 30s, like dark under eye circles, puffiness, tired eyes, fine lines, and wrinkles. To combat the damage, get Geology's effective products by taking the 30-second skincare quiz and get a personalized routine shipped to you. I got the 30-day trial set that included two everyday face washes. Washes. The salicylic acid removes the oil and dirt buildup, and I like how it leaves my skin feeling clean. Anti-aging eye cream. The retinol and hyaluric acid makes this perfect for under eye wrinkles damage and prevention. Repairing night cream. Use this overnight for acne and oily skin. The lower retinol is good for sensitive skin. Tone control morning cream. A daytime moisturizer leaving the skin hydrated, especially in the winter. Use my code NERDEXPLAINS50. Geology is giving you an additional 50% off their award 
award-winning five-piece skincare trial set. This discount stacks on top of their current sale prices. They're also giving you a bonus offer on one of their brand new skin, hair, and body products of your choice when you add it to your trial. Team Arisu manages to figure out the second part, but nothing from your former life of staring at pre-rendered footage of a generic TV show FPS will save you from getting mowed down in a crowd of lemmings. Before we move, we need to figure out exactly where the shooter is to avoid running directly into his line of fire. Simply listening for the source of gunshots is a no-go, as in this environment, they'll likely be echoing off all the surrounding structures. This guy's in a target-rich environment, and with all the chaos, he'll probably be looking for movement. So while we still add cover, we should have had somebody less popular peek out around the corner to see if they could spot him. From there, we'd move to the nearest building that isn't just a set piece and wait for him to move on. Although, we'll definitely want to make sure it has an emergency exit, so we can't get boxed in. Hey! You okay? One thing's for sure, once the running starts, we're not slowing down for anyone, especially the wounded. Yeah, sure, I'm evil for wanting to save my own life. You realize that even if you could buddy carry someone without getting smoked, you lack the medical equipment to actually keep them alive. Best case scenario, you drag them to safety only for them to bleed to death or die of infection later on. Looking at the bigger picture, the most likely objective of this goat rodeo is to put the quiet kid on ice, although he's not exactly making that easy. Since we weren't given a time limit or shown any kind of visible boundaries, our best bet is to break contact for now and come back once we've scrounged up some firepower. After all, he shouldn't be too hard to find with the Hindenburg following his every move. Of course, that's all easier said than done, considering we can't even stick our heads out. Fortunately, the Trigger Man has enough respect for classic cars to let our friends Tata and Ian roll in without getting mulched. I mean, it's not like there's a single part of that cab that could actually stop a bullet. Which raises the question, why are you idiots gawking at that thing like it's a dinosaur. Dude's gonna kill you. Run for your fucking lives. That's bad. Get going! Ah! Bro, what are you doing? In the time it took for you to make your cute little remark, you could have easily supermaned yourself into the back seat in time for them to step on it. Of course, none of this would have mattered if you'd bothered to take your freaking hands out of your pockets and moved like somebody that wasn't trying to get perforated. Meh, whatever. I'm sure I'll be fine. After all, his character actually has a name. Unlike this car full of imbeciles mindlessly following the main characters to their inevitable doom. <laughs> You know, you'd think after an unseen attacker dosed one of your friends in the head, you might try speeding up or swerving a little bit to make it that much harder for him to get the rest of you, especially once you're staring down the barrel of certain death. At that point, a little quick thinking could have handed you the game. Just stomp on the brakes and feed him to the asphalt, followed by that good old-fashioned triple tap, of course. This is one of the final bosses we're dealing with here, so I don't think anyone would blame you for doing a 20-second burnout directly on his face. It's the only way to be sure. And in any case, our hero shouldn't be so nonchalant about being tailed, given we really don't know whether it's just the one edgelord hunting us down. Fact is, after learning in the Ten of Hearts that the game's creators could be playing alongside us, we should be wary of anyone that's not part of our immediate group. And even then, how well can we say we actually know these people? Whatever the answer, it's going to have to wait, because here comes Ghostface for a little GTA action. <laughs> Good thing Ann's ready to jump behind the wheel and show Tata what real speed is. That said, you can't outrun a bullet, and the king of spades ain't no Sunday driver. Instead of trying to burn him on the straightaways, we should whip this thing around as many corners as possible to make it harder for him to line us up. Left turns in particular will force him to either change hands or aim across his windshield, either of which will make accurate shooting even more difficult. As for everyone else, without any way to return fire, they're pretty much just along for the ride. Although Kawina does have the homemade hand grenade Trishia gave before they got separated. Unfortunately, without knowing how long of a delay to expect, we can't exactly time it to explode underneath him. But we could still try tossing it through his open window whenever he pulls up for a kill shot. Dud or not, it'll at least make him think twice about staying inside the car. Ultimately, it doesn't matter, as Death Race 2000 ends with both vehicles wiping out in separate head-up ass-related accidents. Still, despite literally none of them having remembered rule number four, the gang manages to scramble away from the wreckage before Gator gets his gat back. 
It's far from a clean getaway, however, in, in the chaos, and gets split off from the group after stupidly helping someone that probably wasn't going to make it out anyway. Down two members, Erasu, Usagi, Kuina, and Tata hold up in a nearby building for the night and plan their next move. Realizing that King of Spades won't want to interfere with the other game master's operations, they decide to hit up something a little less impossible to get him off their backs. Hey, sounds like a great idea to me. Although, after barely getting away with our lives, the last thing I'm walking into is another King Challenge. Sure, it stands to reason the organizers at this level would know more than anyone else, but no amount of information is useful to a corpse. And if the King of Spades was any indication, the King of Clubs probably involves a Glock and a six-sided dice. Sometime later, the friends arrive at the harbor to find a giant maze made out of shipping containers. By the entrance are four bracelets, along with the sign stating they'll need five players. Oh man, I guess we'll have to let a slightly larger band of morons throw their lives away in pursuit of answers that may not exist. Bummer. And here I was, so excited to charge headfirst into this, without even a second thought. But, you know, there's only four of us. Five, actually. Dude, for real? You couldn't just stay dead back at the beach house. Well, whatever. This doesn't change a thing. As Tata points out, Chris P. Bacon over there is a colossal piece of garbage that will almost certainly screw us over the first chance he gets. The fact he's already got his bracelet on means nothing. If anything, it's all the more reason we should bag this one-way trip and see what the Jack of Clubs is all about. Dude can park his well-done ass in the shade and wait for someone else to come by. Nah, it's fine. Why not blindly trust this loser? It's it's not like our very survival depends on winning or anything. Besides, how bad could it possibly be? Yeah, the, uh, the answer's real bad. Cause it turns out, the guy who created this thing is totally nuts. After monologuing to everyone, including his own teammates, about the joys of prolonged UV exposure, King No Pants kicks things off by laying down the rules. The name of the game is Shipment. Well, it's osmosis, but that's what I'm calling it. And much like the Call of Duty map, it's an absolute cluster. Fundamentally, the object of the game is to be the team with the most points after two hours. Each team of five starts with 10,000 points, which are then divided among the players however they see fit. Points are scored by either battling with players on the opposite team, finding items scattered throughout the maps, or touching the opposing team's base. We'll start with battling, since that sounds the most interesting. Spoiler alert, it's really lame. So, basically, you touch an enemy, and whoever has the most points robs 500 points from the other player, and thus the other team. It's impossible possible to tell how many points the other player has just by looking at them, so this makes it somewhat of a gamble. To improve your odds, you can hold on to a member of your own team to combine your points totals while also making it impossible to catch anyone. Yeah, in the show they make it look like a viable strategy for racking up points, but there's no way, realistically, you could actually catch somebody joined together like this. I mean, I guess if they were really stupid, but they'd pretty much have to be brain dead. Anyway, the key thing to remember about battling is that regardless of whether you win or lose, after a battle, you're out of commission, meaning you can't exchange points in any way until you tag back in at your own base. During this time, if a member of the opposing team touches you, it'll shock the living out of both of you and knock you on the ground. Again, remember that one for later. Next up are items, and they're a complete waste of time. I'll get to why here in a bit, but for now, all you need to know is that there's six of them scattered around the map in shipping containers, and if you're the first person to touch one, you and by extension your team will get the corresponding number of points, which comes to 10,500 when you add them all together. Finally, we have bases. Each team gets a home base. If you touch the enemy base, you'll get 10,000 points. However, However, this will not be deducted from the other team's score. You'll also be rendered out of commission. As you can imagine, it's extremely important that you protect this thing. But the good news is goalies are totally OP. As long as you're touching your own base, your point total becomes infinite. And if you touch another player, they, and subsequently their team, lose 10,000 points. Now, of course, most players, even after finding items, probably aren't going to have that many. So, this will most likely put them in the negative. And that's bad. If at any time, for any reason, reason your score drops below zero, you only get about a minute to wax poetic before getting space lasered. Hold on. Yeah, you got a question? How do we remember all this? Dude, for real. This game is bullshit. 
Going forward, we should remember to bring a pen and paper to write down all the rules. After all, the sign said no weapons. It didn't say anything about school supplies. Oh, yeah, that reminds me. Unless specifically forbidden by the rules, my go-to strat for every one of these is to roll in armed to the teeth and whittle down the competition as much as possible. If that means spending all our time between matches looting and scooting, so be it. If I'm going to go down, it definitely will not be because someone else had the foresight to bring in a fork. So, getting back to the matter at hand. Our cup runneth over, because I got two prime strats that are sure to leave these losers breathing out some new holes in their heads. The first one, I call shock and awe. So, remember how I said the key thing about battling is how you get knocked out of commission? Well, it's literally the only reason battles are even worth it in the first place. Seriously, plus or minus 500 points is nothing when there's a 10,000 point white whale flopping around out there. Instead, we're going to use it to turn one of our players into a human weapon against the other team. <laughs> First things first, we need to allocate our team's points. Obviously, whoever's guarding home base gets the bare minimum, which in this case is 100. Team Erisu figures this out right off the bat, but where they go wrong is setting up only one goalie. Team Nerd, on the other hand, is going with two. They'll stand back to back with a pull between them, each one touching home base with their foot to keep both hands open. This ensures 360 degrees of coverage and pretty much makes it impossible for the other team to reach in without getting got. We'll want our slowest and most bloodthirsty teammates here as this will require zero running and a killer instinct. So I'm thinking Tata and Crispy. Obviously, Tata doesn't have much of the latter, but he's turtle slow. And honestly, I just don't trust him to do anything else. That leaves Erisu, Usagi, and Kuina for the field team. And it legit doesn't matter how we divide the remaining 9,800 points between them. Really, as long as they all have enough so that one or two battles won't kill them, that's fine. When the game starts, we'll have Usagi use her special climbing powers to get up on top of the shipping crates and scout ahead, something they'll take advantage of way too late in the game. Her goal will be to spot an enemy player, or players, at which time we'll have one of the others run over and battle them, regardless of the outcome. When that's over, instead of sending them back to base to tag in, we'll have them regroup with the other two and carry on. From there, Usagi will follow the now out of commission adversary back to their place, taking care to stay out of sight lest they send their own parkour freak after her. In addition to the obvious outcome of finding their base, this will also ensure they can't catch us off guard with the same tactic. Once we reach the objective, we'll hang back and wait for their player to tag back in and leave the area. Ideally, there will only be one goalie, but the plane will probably work with two as long as we're quick. When the time is right, the three of us will charge in with the out of commission player up front. He'll hit the goalie and or goalies first and incapacitate them, clearing the way for the two to go tag the base and put us up by a cool 20k. All that's left to do then is bring the field team home as quickly as possible and join the goalies in protecting the base. And boom, we've won. Even if they managed to find all the items, there would be no possible way for the other team to make up the difference, which is why looking for them in the first place is totally pointless, along with the fact that there's an entire sh ton of shipping containers and the people who made the freaking game probably know where they all are anyway. Plan number two is almost the exact same thing, only with a different ending. I call it Shock and Awe 2. The difference is, after Usagi follows the Attica mission opponent back to their base, she'll regroup with the rest of the field team and go scouting for another lone enemy player, preferably the same one as before to add insult to injury. Now, before we spring phase two, we'll want to use our clothing to fashion a rope with a go to sleep loop on one end of it. Once we find a suitable mark, we'll have our Attica mission players zap the them and knock them down, and then the others will rush in and loop the rope around one or both of their feet, taking extreme care to not touch their skin in the process as to avoid a battle. From there, we just drag them screaming back to our base to have Crispy put the finishing touches on them, at which point we'll go up 10,000, they'll go down 10,000, and their player gets to tell us all his entire life story while we wait for them to get zapped. You picked me? You better use this to win. If I die in vain... <laughs> Just like before, this will create a 20,000 point deficit that will be impossible for them to overcome. Best part about either of these plans is that they still remain perfectly viable even after the other team first takes the lead. Even more so because it cost them one of their players and they ended up pulling their goalie into the field to help search for items. Unfortunately, Arasu decides to focus all their effort on items as well, allowing the enemy team to rack up a massive lead in the process. And by the time he realizes the value of out of commission players, the Kings team feels comfortable 
capable enough to leave three people watching their base. Still, they could have pulled it off had Kawina immediately sprang into action the moment Crispy cleared the goalpost. Seriously, what the f were you waiting for? Not to mention the fact that she got tagged, making the deficit even that much wider. Of course, I can't pin this all on her. After all, Arisu pretty much just laid there and watched instead of using his special status to lead block. You were only shocked for a second, dude. The guy Crispy shocked literally had time to get back on his feet and jump kick your friend out of midair while you were still rolling around on the ground. What gives? After that blunder, I can't exactly blame Team Arisu for coming apart at the seams. Well, except for Crispy and what he does to Usagi. Can't really show that. I get it now. I'm garbage. Say what you want about Tata, he totally called that one. Fact is, there's literally no possible way they could actually win at this point. You know, unless the king of clubs himself decides he cannot wait 10 minutes to go on a walk. You can see the scoreboard just like everyone else, right? You know they're only down by 500 points, and it's not out of the question they could ambush you with the combined score and turn things around. For Christ's sake, at least take somebody with you. You'd still have two people to keep the base locked down. Ultimately, it doesn't even come down to a dramatic final showdown. Erisu just straight up asks to shake his hand. All right, okay, there's a little more to it than that. Turns out the stress of his impending death, coupled with years of being ashamed of his own incompetence, pushed Tata over the edge. I mean, hey, nothing in the rules said you couldn't pull the bracelet off your teammate's mangled wrist and slip it into your pocket for one final battle. You are way more screwed up than I thought. Oh, okay, says the bare lunatic who built a death game with like a million rules. Sorry, I'm willing to take advantage of my friend's noble sacrifice in order to survive. You're right, I'm the sicko. Just hurry up and die so we can get out of here. Wishful thinking, I know. Obviously, the sky laser thing is gonna let him filibuster a few more minutes of precious life before the end, but at least we can find out something about the situation at large, right? No, not really. Turns out he doesn't really know anything. Good thing we went with the king, huh? Elsewhere in the city, it seems Chishia managed to give the king of spades the slip, only to throw himself right back in the thick of it with a casual jack of hearts. This one's called solitary confinement, but I think the name death sentence more accurately conveys the nature of this game. The rules are fairly simple, but don't let that fool you. This sh it's nearly impossible. There are 20 contestants, all wearing dead money collars around their necks. On the back of each collar is a screen showing one of four card suits. Every hour, the players will separate into individual jail cells and say out loud which suit they think they have. If they get it right, they go on to the next round. If not... Ouch. Yeah, there's gonna be a lot of that. Using any kind of reflection to look at your own suit is expressly forbidden. And since it changes every round, your chances of guessing your way out of this are basically zero. Instead, your only real option is to ask your fellow players what it is. Sounds easy enough, right? After all, what possible reason would anyone have to lie? Well, <laughs> we're getting to that. You see, hidden among the players just so happens to be the Jack of Hearts himself, and the game will run indefinitely until either he dies or everyone else does. So, now you see the problem. The only way out of here is to trick the Jack into saying the wrong suit. And since we have no idea who that might be, no matter how we approach this, the only way out is by systematically eliminating other players until we finally get our man. Naturally, the easiest way to beat this one would be to go into it with at least one close friend who you trust implicitly. At that point, it would be impossible for either one of you to be eliminated. And you could both simply lie to everyone else and so complete and utter chaos without fear of reprisal. However, being this is a hearts game, pretty much no one would think to do that, since under most circumstances, you'd be required to stab your buddy in the back. Speaking of which, the use of weapons or violence of any kind to kill other players is strictly prohibited. <sighs> I know. So we can't just battle royale our way to victory. That said, there's nothing that says we can't severely injure people to the point that they deliberately provide the wrong answer to end their own suffering. The only problem is, you'd still need someone to watch your back, so to speak. And attacking others is a great way to get the axe. Take Mr. Affliction Shirt, for example. 
told you to give me the answer. Tell him he's a club. Yeah, we all know how this ends. Seriously, how could you not see that coming? At the same time, the geek should have known better than to nail this dirtbag. Even if it's justified, being the first person to take someone out will undoubtedly raise suspicion, and he totally pays for it. Fact is, all he had to do to keep the bully bro from beating on him was give him the answer. Besides, it seems pretty unlikely that Jack would be so quick to paint a target on his back. Which brings me to the core of her strategy. There's absolutely no way to identify the Jack based on any Anything besides how they play the game. So, we'll have to find a way to make him expose himself. At first, one might think we need to create a situation in which no one could possibly lie without getting caught. Kind of like the nutcase in the blue dress does by forming a group to keep each other honest. The problem with doing this is that everyone, including the Jack, will know that taking someone out or trying to manipulate people will immediately make them a target, and thus nothing actually gets done. Sure, there's no time limit, our visas can't expire, and we have enough food and water to last us quite a while, but after a few days of no one sleeping longer than an hour at a time, pretty much everyone will be too delirious to be trustworthy, and there's a good chance we might end up sleeping through our date with destiny. On the other hand, if there's no accountability at all, then no one trusts anyone, and people will start blowing each other's heads off left and right, which is just as bad for the Jack as it is for us, since they also depend on getting answers from another player. This is pretty much where Little Miss Robespierre's group falls apart. She turns it from a circle of trust into to her own private hit squad, and everyone becomes so paranoid that they eventually turn on her. Spade. Thank God for that one. I mean, I get she wasn't the Jack, but only a total psychopath would go bopping around like a Disney princess in this nightmare world. We're all probably better off without her. Ultimately, all this is to say that we need to strike a balance between order and chaos to get through this, and that pretty much means there could be no single solution that encompasses the entire group nor can everyone run off on their own. Instead, we, meaning our individual player, need to find a single partner early on, preferably someone less intelligent and or assertive than ourselves, and make them understand that they're just as dependent on us as we are them. We then need to ensure that they trust absolutely no one else by constantly reinforcing this notion in their mind, which will only become easier once everyone else starts cutting each other's throats. This is the same strategy Chishia, Suitbro, and the X-Con all employ, which is why they and their respective toadies all make it to the final six. Central to this approach is making sure our partnership is publicly known. That way, Jack or not, they won't dare take us out in fear of being isolated. Of course, for that very same reason, we'll want to make sure whoever we team up with is mentally and emotionally stable. I won't do this. Seems I've lost my partner. Oof. Yeah, good luck explaining that to everyone else. Barring this unforeseen development, our only way forward would have been to remain vigilant for any signs of cross-contamination between pairs. With six players remaining, the Jack wouldn't betray his partner directly, as this would leave him the odd man out. But he may try to single out and subtly manipulate members of other groups into moving on their teammates. However, this wouldn't come out of the blue. In all likelihood, the Jack would have been conspiring with this person in secret for some time now, which is all the more reason we need to keep an eye on our other half. In this case, Chishia discovered Suit Girl was taking orders from the guy with the hair after realizing they were surreptitiously confirming each other's symbols with color-coded snack bags. It's ridiculous if you ask me, but whatever. They probably would have gotten away with it if not for our guy's Jimmy Neutron-level plot intelligence. I caught on pretty quickly. Yeah, sure you did. However we go about sussing out the Jack, once we find him, we need to approach him in secret the first chance we get and tell him we think it's someone on the other remaining team. Doesn't matter who, we just need him to think he's got us fooled to make ourselves appear like less of a threat. Now, things get messy. If he was working with someone on the other team, we just let nature take its course and then fatally shun the surviving player. It's what they get for being a chump anyway. This is when our mutual trust with our teammates is more important than ever. With only our pair and the Jack's pair remaining, the two of us need to split up and independently meet with the Jack, each of us claiming we're going to do the other end. Provided he takes the bait, the Jack will then proceed to flip on his own teammate, thereby hosing himself in the process. It's far from an exact science, for sure, but it's pretty much the only chance we would have at that point. Rewinding for a second, if it turned out the Jack was in cahoots with our partner all along, then we'd have no choice but to put him down, leaving us in the exact same position Chishia finds himself in right now. Looks like I'm screwed. 
chill out, Geralt of Rivia. We're not pwned yet. Although, admittedly, it's not looking good. That said, there is an upside to this situation. Since everyone thinks we're it, we can do and say literally whatever we want to try and mess with them. I mean, there's absolutely no way we can trust them to give us the correct suit now. In fact, Chishia ends up playing this to his advantage by using the two phony answers he receives from the lesser intelligent members of the two pairs to make it a 50-50. What's the most you ever lost on a coin toss? Well, Jesus, when Anton Chigurh says it, it doesn't feel like that much of a win. Now, he did improve his odds past 50-50 by asking the other players as well. With club and heart out being phony answers, that leaves diamond and spade. None of the other players had a diamond, and two of the other players already had a spade, which is the potential max if all the suits were being represented equally between the remaining players. So, the obvious choice becomes diamond. Either way, it's all we got. So, I hope you've been brushing up on your ESP. Nah, you know this dude's gonna clutch it. I can't even remember any of the other guys' names. Unfortunately, even if we guessed correctly, we'd be pretty much done for unless we found a way to get through to the others beforehand. After all, the Jack would probably assume he took us out of the picture, prompting him to waste his partner and psyop suit girl into taking hers out along with herself. At that point, it'd just be the two of us, meaning we'd both be left with a 75% chance of blowing our heads off. Fortunately for us, Suit Guy and the X-Con bonded over the urinals and forged a secret alliance of their own, allowing the three of us to dramatically emerge from our jail cells one by one to rain on the Jack's parade. As for why his own partner didn't light him up, it turns out Erisu isn't the only one looking for some answers. Like I said before, nothing in the rules says that you can't make them wish they were dead. I'm sorry that we won't be able to kill you. <laughs> There are a lot of other ways to have fun. Ah, finally. Your stupid parlor game gave me a migraine. All right, let's check in with Erisu and company. Having lost Tata to exsanguination, the main group is down yet another player. And to make matters worse, Queena left to wander a massive city patrolled by a heavily armed psychopath to search for a single person that may not be alive. Can't see that going sideways. As for Erisu and Nusagi, they take advantage of their newly extended visas to rustle up some grub the old-fashioned way. Gee, Jesus, you're really gonna try catching rabbits by hand. It's called a snare, you pillix. Seriously, it's a good thing this isn't one of the games or you'd both be screwed. In fact, you know what? That's my death game. We'll tie some kitchen knives and razor blades to them and make it sporting. Catch three rabbits before the time runs out or get space lasered. I call it blood bunnies. Rank, God Emperor of Spades. Hopefully it makes the cut for season three. Suddenly, a nearby commotion leads them to the site of a massacre. Hmm, I wonder if this has anything to do with the roving gunman smoking everyone in sight. I know, let's ask this guy. Are you okay? Dude, for real? That's what you're gonna lead with? Oh, well, he wasn't all that helpful anyway. Regardless, it's time to GTFO. The fact that there was someone clinging to life around here suggests went south so much recently, meaning the killer might still be in the area. We can check the other bodies for warmth if we want to be sure, but I wouldn't even waste time doing that, knowing the King of Spades could be lining us up with a 50 this very second. Nah, it's probably fine. Might as well just corner ourselves inside this RV turned dark room to watch some losers home videos. After all, I'm sure he captured something truly profound and not just a bunch of disjointed garbage. Let me save you a watch. The film is composed mainly of random nonsense culminating in a dramatic interview with some lobotomite who claims she remembers how they all got here. But just as she's about to say something totally unverifiable, you know who shows up to tell her about the rabbits. But they weren't actually. It's the thing of faith! Well, at least now we know what happened, as if it were actually a mystery. The good news is, Spielberg managed to get some footage of Anne before he got dosed, so at least we know she's still alive, right? No, not really. She could have just as easily been killed immediately after this was recorded. And even if she wasn't, there's no telling where that was captured or where she was even headed. So this was pretty much just a complete waste of time. Only question now is, why is the ground shaking? Well, wouldn't you know it, everyone's favorite mass murderer came back for a sequel. What, you idiots never heard of the killer always returning to the scene of the crime? That said, the only way he could have known to start lighting up the RV would be if he had some kind of tracking technology, which makes sense, considering there's an armed satellite watching her every move. Of course, this means our only option is to run like hell.
as hiding is completely out of the question. It's also one of the few times when splitting up actually makes sense, even if it means we have to search for each other later on. Not only can he only go after one of us, he might just bag it all together in favor of a more densely clustered prey he can mow down all at once. It's kind of his thing. However, while Erisu manages to give KOS the slip, it seems he's not out of the woods yet. Wait, was that a spear? Great, can't wait to see how this turns out. Fortunately, instead of getting trussed up like a hog, Erisu awakened sometime later to find he was rescued by his former beach buddy, Aguni, along with his stalwart teenage sidekick, Akane. Evidently, they knocked him out to stop him from getting himself killed. You know, cause a serious head injury isn't gonna be a huge liability out here. Seriously, you couldn't just pull a classic, come with me if you wanna live? At least then you wouldn't have to carry his ass. Quick side note, in case you were wondering how Akane became the Blade Runner, turns out it happened shortly after she entered the zone. One second, she's gossiping with her girlfriends walking home from high school. The next minute, she's standing in the middle of a stadium with 16 randos. This one's called How to Make Soccer Less Boring, and it's a seven of spades. The object is to not die horribly as the entire stadium caves in on itself. <laughs> Oh, yeah, that looks fair. Strategy-wise, not a lot I can say besides run like Tom Cruise and keep an eye out for exit signs. And even then, if your number's up, your number's up. In the end, only Akane made it out alive, but not without taking a piece of rebar through the shin. Fun. Lucky for her, she was able to find a doctor willing to operate for a nominal fee, of course. Turns out, even in the Upside Down, nothing in this world is free, which our hero is about to learn the hard way. In exchange for saving his life, Erisu's rescuers conscript him into their mission to hunt down the King of Spades. What's their plan, you might ask? Don't worry about it, dude. Why don't you just hang out at the tent and relax? We'll take of everything else. Safe to say, on a manhunt, if you can't figure out who the bait is, it's probably you. But at least they were nice enough to give him the pump action. Let's hope he knows how to use it, because here comes the big bad right now. Hmm, looks like he's got himself a sweet pair of dual tubes with the white phosphorus. I call dibs on those when this is all over, provided our new friends get off their asses before he remembers he has an assault rifle. Huh, that was a lot easier than I thought it would be. Someone put a quadruple tap in this guy before he pulls a selfie. Dude's running nods, a light 50, and frag grenades. Obviously, he's gonna have some kind of plate carrier on. See what I mean? What a waste of an ambush. Now you have to deal with him head on, and that's probably not gonna go great for you, especially since a third of your attack force can't even stand up to the recoil of the weapon you gave him. For real, Erisu's lucky he got blown off the edge before things got too crazy. This guy's basically John Wick, and he's got the equipment to match. So if the three of us couldn't take him out in the surprise party, we should have just hit him with another flare and broke contact. After all, if a grizzled vet like a goonie couldn't take him in a one-on-one -on -one gun foo, what hope do the rest of us have? killer moves and all, but you know what would have been more disruptive than a flying jump kick? One of those broadheads through his eye socket. What, is that bow just for decoration? Oh, well, props to her for keeping a Goonies narrative arc alive. Something tells me we'll need him later on. Now on his own, Erisu sets out to find Usagi. Yeah, good luck with that. Might as well check in on Kawina to give him time to search. Looks like she's landed herself in some kind of 1v whatever cage match. Jack of spades my how is a single person supposed to fight off over a dozen people armed with pipes and machetes? At least with a king, we could go around recruiting an army of nobodies to soak up all his ammunition while we hide. I mean, supervise from a good safe distance. <laughs> Actually, never mind. She seems to be handling things just fine on her own. That said, for those of us without her level 9000 plot armor, our only chance would be to use one of those loose weapons to knock out the only overhead lamp lighting up the dojo. From there, it becomes a simple game of reverse Marco Polo until the time runs out. Oh, yeah, I forgot about the name. Hmm, how about be a main character? I like it. Okay, Erisu, find her yet? Actually, yeah, she was at the first game he decided to play. Only she's not alone. During her travels, Usagi ran into an orphan who somehow managed to stay alive long enough to make it this far. Great. You're telling me, in addition to fighting tooth and nail just to barely save our own lives, we have to babysit this kid? Could you imagine if we had to carry him through something like the cargo container game? He'd make Tata look like pre-2018 Kratos. You know, the cool one. Oh, and to top it all off, you brought him to the Queen of Spades. Not even a clubs game where we could at least count on working together. Plus, for all you know, it involved 
involves power lifting or I don't know maybe more of this Where's it coming from? You know what? Fine. I'm sure the kid will be a huge asset and not corrupt our sense of self-preservation one iota. Let's just get to the rules. So this one's called Waifu Tag. You'll find out why here in a minute. For starters, there are two teams. The Challenger Team, us, with 16 members, and the Queen's Team, with only four. Each player wears a vest with a large button on the back and lights indicating which team they're on. The game itself consists of 16 rounds lasting five minutes each. In one round, the Queen's Team will will try to tag as many of us as possible. Those who get tagged will be unable to move until the next round, at which time they'll become members of the opposite team. You probably already know where I'm going with this. In round two, we chase them, and it goes back and forth like that until the end of the round 16, when whoever has the most players on their team wins. If you're like me, right now you're thinking something like, why the hell wouldn't everyone just let themselves get tagged so that we can all be on the winning team? Well, there's a catch. Each team has a king who isn't allowed to change sides and take a wild guess who our king is. I choose him. Yep, that figures. Thanks again, Usagi. I'm kidding, of course. This is an absolute non-issue. What do I care if some random rug rat gets instead in this hole? It'll be a lot more humane than all the other horrific ways he could go out. Tough luck. The rest of us are lining up on round one to go join the winning team. There is one more caveat here I forgot to mention. If we win on the Queen's team, then we technically haven't beaten the game. But we will be allowed to remain here as temporary citizens and continue playing against other teams of challengers until someone inevitably wins. So, okay, we can't actually end this nightmare unless we win as the challengers, but therein lies the beauty of it. As long as we fight for the Queen of Spades, our visas won't expire, and the King of Spades can't touch us. At that point, we just hang around here and build our strength while other players work through the rest of the face card games. Eventually, this will be the only game remaining, at which time we'll have both our ninja warrior skills, the map knowledge to turn the tables on the Queen of Spades and earn our ticket home. But nerd, you say? The Queen's team only has four players, including herself. How do we know she won't just keep three of us and let the rest get zapped? Well, by some strange twist of fate, it turns out she has some kind of weird crush on her young Arisu. For real, check this out. Arisu or something. Yeah, exactly. I want him. See what I mean? That's the gravy train right there, fellas. I mean, I could think of a lot worse than playing concubine to some warrior queen. Yeah, sorry, Usagi. We're gonna have to put a pin in that awkward romance of ours until we can finally sort this out. You understand, right? Of course, there's no telling how long it might take for all the other games to be cleared. From our penthouse suite in the parkour tower, we might be able to see the other face card blimps exploding as contestants finally win, or by secretly questioning each new wave of contestants in waifu tag as to how how many other games there are left. It could take some time. I mean, that King of Spades dude was hard as hell to kill. We might eventually be forced to start a family with her. Just think, she's becoming fully invested in our future together, her better judgment being corrupted by rising oxytocin levels as she carries her nerd child, her athleticism and physical fitness taking a hit from the pregnancy. With the last of the other games being beaten and the queen being compromised, it's the perfect time to betray her and run off into the sunset with Usagi. All it took to ensure our victory setup was a child sacrifice directly causing the death of countless waves of contestants contestants joining the challenger team, indirectly causing the death of countless waves of contestants whose visas expired, betraying a pregnant chick we got to fall in love with us, and keeping our true lover at a distance while we started a family with an evil but hot queen chick. Too easy. Now, with our setup complete, we employ my foolproof strat to put this one in the bag. I call it 300-ish. First thing we do is allow ourselves to be tagged by the challenger team before they lose a numerical advantage. Once it's our turn to defend, instead of scattering like a bunch of stupid cockroaches, we all hang together in a sort of phalanx formation and back ourselves into a corner. After all, they can't tag us if they can't reach our backs, and the rules allow us to fight back as long as we don't use weapons. <laughs> Now, just imagine how pissed off she'll be when we stab her in the back. Yeah, we better be ready to scrap, because this will be a literal battle of life and death. It goes without saying, the best fighters will be up front, with everyone else watching their backs and using their hands to cover the first row's light buttons, and to make sure no one gets dragged out of the ranks. If all goes according to plan, we'll be able to maintain our numbers throughout the round, at which point enemy players will likely see the writing on the wall and start begging us to tag them over. Having said all this, I suppose we could implement this strategy from the very beginning.
beginning, if we're just dead set on saving the bedwetter. I get it. Some people just have bizarre emotional hangups that prevent them from doing what it takes to win. That's just reality. Whatever the case, we'll want to have a backup plan in case we lose the advantage. I mean, I have the utmost confidence in the previously mentioned approach, but it never hurts to have a plan B. In that case, Usagi's idea of winning the others over by inspiring them to strive for something greater than playing pawns in the Queen's Gambit isn't a bad idea. In fact, we should have started doing that from the very beginning. I want to make it back to our world. This world makes kindness easy to forget. I want to return. Okay, not quite sure what all that means, but it seems to do the trick. Probably also worth mentioning how most of the winners on the Queen's team would probably be killed off to make room for the next batch. Even if it's not true, a little FUD can go a long way, especially when there's lasers involved. Other than that, it's just a matter of running the others down and falling back to the Phalanx formation whenever we're on the defensive. Of course, the Queen of Spades isn't going to just lay down and die, so we'll probably have to bait her into an ambush using Arasu and then rush her as a group to put her out of commission permanently. I'm sure Usagi won't have a problem with that. Ultimately, the challenger team pulls it together in time to save the boy, and all it costs us was the surest path to surviving the card game as a whole. As for the Queen of Spades, she decides to go out with a bang. Huh, well, I guess it's more of a sickening thud. Oh, and before you ask, she didn't share anything valuable about the overall situation before getting zapped, so I guess we're all gonna have to stay tuned to figure out just what the hell What's going on here? All right, what's next? Well, elsewhere in town, it seems Chishia decided to pit himself against the King of Diamonds. But dude, like, why though? After beating the Jack of Hearts, you've got like 11 days on your visa. Let someone else tackle this. Nah, who am I kidding? Nobody without their own page in the wiki is pulling this one off. This game's called Meltdown. And despite involving math, it's actually very entertaining to watch. For this one, all five players, including the King of Diamonds himself, are strapped to their chairs. Each round, they'll go around the table choosing numbers between 0 and 100. The average of their choices will then be multiplied by 0.8, and whoever is closest to the resulting product wins, while the others all lose one point. Everyone starts at 0, and if you drop down to negative 10, you're out, which is where these giant scales come in. With every lost point, they fill up with a little more sulfuric acid until you're eliminated, and then... <laughs> Oops, spoiler alert, as if we didn't already know who's gonna be walking out of here. Also, new rules are added after each death, but we'll deal with those when we get there. Which is gonna be soon, by the way, because this one's worse than the Jack of Hearts. So, strategy-wise, holy shit, man. Let's start with what we know. Picking a number over 80 is pointless, since 80 is the largest possible output. And since everyone knows that, picking a number over 64 is also pointless. Then that means picking a number over 51 is pointless which would mean picking a number over 41 is pointless. Which, yeah, you, you see where this is headed. It's a race to the bottom. If everyone picks zero, then the answer will always be zero, meaning no one loses, and this game lasts until we all die of dehydration. Well, either that, or we all lose at exactly the same rate. Thus, everyone gets melted at the same time, and that won't do either. Oh, and just to get this out of the way, there's no indication whatsoever that outside weapons and cold-blooded murder are off limits here, and given there's an acid bath involved, I'd say this is definitely the game where we'd want to give those a try. I mean, considering everyone's belted in, all you need is a knife to cut yourself free and do the deed. We also know for sure Chishia has at least one of those homemade explosives scrolled away, but without knowing the effective blast radius, it's probably best we save it for the 1v1. So, back to the maps. Just like Jack of Hearts, the only way we can move things along is by creating conditions where other players can be eliminated, and that means making decisions decisions that aren't perfectly rational. Sure, you can try and predict what others will do, but they're going to be basing their actions on predictions of what everyone else is going to do, leaving us with a never-ending cycle of predicting people's predictions. I think all of you are overthinking this. Just saying, you should probably listen to this guy. I mean, just look at his hair. This is what does in the first two guys. They both think that they can read everyone's minds based on what the most logical choice would be for them to make. But people don't really work that way. Fact is, the guy who created this game is a lawyer, not a mathematician. So unless he double majored, the solution here probably doesn't involve solving insane multivariable equations in one's head. If anything, it's more about convincing people to feel a specific way. So on to the number 
number picks. To start things off, I'll go with something pretty much middle of the road. And just like Chishia, that's 32. Reason being, anything over 80 is pointless. And the median of 0 to 80 is 40. 40 times 0.8 equals 32. For what I'm sure are a variety of different reasons, everyone else goes with the number close to this, with the King of Diamonds winning on 29. Now, logically speaking, as we all lose points, our answers will start trending towards zero, since that would be the safest choice. However, you don't want to pick zero too early, or you'll lose the early rounds, and you'll prematurely start the race towards zero. But as stated previously, once everyone starts doing that, the game can't progress, so I'd probably just drop my number by only half each time to keep from causing a panic. 32, 16, 8, 4, 2, 1. Once we notice everyone's answers drop below, say, 5, we should shake things up like Chishia does by dropping a hundo in the next round. Why'd you do that? You picked 100, that means you'll always lose. Bruh, you think I don't know that? The point is you all lost too. Of course, had everyone still chosen zero here, Chishia would have been the only person to lose. But since this lady went with a one, she ended up winning and the rest of us, including the king, all lost a point. Herein lies the object of the game. Bleed everyone out as quickly as possible by maximizing the amount of chaos in the system and making the safest bet unsafe, it ensures that at least four people will get dinged every time, especially those that choose zero. Outside of that, it's just a guessing game. The fact that the king won four times in a row is purely coincidental. However, let's say everyone, including what's-her-name, all picked zeros, and only we, as in Chishia, lost. The next round, I'd go with the 100 again, to make it glaringly obvious to everyone that they could very likely hurt us all by picking a number between 1 and 47. 101 divided by 5 times 0.8 equals 16.16, and 147 divided by 5 times 0.8 equals 23.52. After all, we would have been every bit as host picking just 1 as 100 at that point. But it wouldn't have stirred things up as much. As soon as it's clear that someone else understands this, things will have reset in a way. I'd bring my number back around to 32 again in case someone followed my example, and then gradually coast back down towards 0 without actually hitting it. In this case, Chishia only had to win twice to outlast the first two players, who both picked 0 more than anyone else in the game, including on their final turns. It is game over for the participants. At least have the decency to do them both at the same time. The anticipation, my god. With two players down, we get two new rules. First, if two or more players pick the same number, they automatically lose, even if that number is correct. This means we can't all just zero out to save our own skins. The second rule states that if someone's choice is a direct match with the output number, everyone else loses two points instead of one. However, for the same reason after hearing all this, everyone hits zero, which, along with one and two, are the numbers multiple people are most likely to choose. Plus, by picking zero, you're ensuring that you couldn't possibly hit the output number dead on, since it would have to be higher than that by virtue of the others having picked something else. As for how this development influences our strategy, it doesn't. If I'm Chishia with minus 8 in that situation, I'm starting things over with a nice 32 and hoping for the best. Win or lose, I'm going from there down to 16 just like before, which would put me close to the 23 Chishia went with. And in a shocking turn of events that would give Jim Carrey fits, that turns out to be a bingo. Question is, how? When you put someone on the spot and ask them to choose a number they usually go for eights threes and fives and some of those are prime Oh, you straight up guessed. Is that what you're trying to say? Yeah, get out of here with your prime numbers. No one's buying it. Not to mention the fact that you would have had to have known the king would be going with a one. Whatever. Get melted, lady. Let's get this over with. Now down to only two, the final rule is revealed. If one player chooses zero, the other player will insta-win by choosing 100. And with that, the game has just morphed into rock, paper, scissors. A simple child's game based almost entirely on luck with a pinch of prediction. Think about it. Zero beats one because one divided by two multiplied by 0 0.8 is 0 0.4. And one beats everything above it because the final output would always be less than half of the other number. It's actually worse than that, since picking the same number would cost us each a point, and with Chishia at minus nine to the king's minus seven, that would be the end of it. I hate to say it, but our chances of pulling this off are dismal. One in 27, to be exact. So unless Unless this stone-faced ghoul has a major tell, I'd say it's time to open up our can of...
exists. Fortunately for Chishia, he was able to piece together this dude's entire life story in the short amount of time they've been sitting across from one another. It turns out he created this game to completely remove himself from having to choose who dies by leaving it purely up to chance. Knowing this, Chishia straight up tells him he's gonna choose 100, thereby forcing the decision on the king regardless. And guess what? Dude deliberately loses three times in a row because of this. I gave you the chance to make that choice. I'm so jealous of you. I'm sorry, you say you're jealous of the guy that just got melted to death by a vat of acid. Yeah, you definitely belong here. Well, that was fun. Of course, were this a sane world where the villains wouldn't just roll over and die once you guessed what they had for dinner last night, we'd be forced to actually play this guy, and that would almost certainly be the death of us. There's no strategy we could employ here that would give us any kind of advantage. That said, people have overcome far worse odds than this. We just have to trust our gut and see what happens. With the King of Diamonds getting stewed, we're down to only two remaining face card games. Well, the only two that matter anyway. Just for fun, I'll run through a few honorable mentions that didn't even get their own segments. First up is the Queen of Clubs. Falls to the wall. Yeah, it's basically multi-team dodgeball. Not much I can really say here besides don't get hit. And try to remember the five Ds of dodgeball. Deflect, dominate, distract, disarm, disable. You know, this one would be kind of awesome were it not for the whole losers getting lasered aspect of it. Oh, and as you can see, Kawina and Anne were finally reunited, so take a wild guess which pair's coming out on top. That said, it's worth mentioning this is yet another game where we have no idea whether outside weapons are allowed. If so, Anne needs to slap leather on that snub nose and start throwing lead. Statistically speaking, people are much easier to hit with a dodgeball after they've been shot. After that is Gym Class Hero. Row. Much like the rope climb in actual gym class, central to completing this one is to get tough and not be a punk. Evidently, the Jack of Clubs himself is among the players, and the game runs until he falls to his death. It's unclear whether everyone knows who he is right off the bat, but either way, our strategy remains the same. When the game starts, we need to slide as far down the rope as we're allowed to and use the S-wrap technique to hold ourselves in place. From there, we tie a stopper knot on the line so we can easily rest on it and hunker down until the this mess eventually sorts itself out. Yeah, good luck keeping that up for any amount of time. As long as our bright idea doesn't catch on, the others will be dropping like flies in no time, especially the Jack after fighting off who knows how many players. Otherwise, I'd much rather take my chances seeing who can hang out the longest without falling asleep than bet the farm playing Tarzan. This next one is a classic, Flee the Beast. At first, I wasn't sure why the King of Hearts would be about solving a labyrinth, but it actually makes perfect sense. You see, there's an easy trick you can use to solve pretty much any maze called the left hand method. Basically, you take your left hand, ball it into a fist, and then savagely beat the guys next to you so the monster has something to chew on while you find your way out. <laughs> piece of cake. And finally, we've got the Jack of Diamonds, Mahjong. You just, you, you just play Mahjong. Yeah, so I don't actually know anything about this game, but my suggestion would be to cheat and or roll a frag grenade under the table when no one's looking. Other than that, I'm not quite sure what I'm even looking at here. I mean, is this normal? This amount of screaming. Mahjong nerds, let us know in the comments how you'd rig this one down in the comments. Okay, now we're down to the last two, and wouldn't you know it, they're right beside one another in Shibuya back where it all began. You know you're about to get down on a boss fight when you find a pristine over-under shotgun and shells just lying out in the open. However, that's going to have to wait, as just as Arasu and Shishia are about to reunite for one final mission, our old friend Crispy clacks off a game of his own. Well, I... I thought I'd never see you again. Did you mean to miss a vital organ? What, do you want him to try again? Nah, that wouldn't be sporting. Like I said, this is his idea of a game. Call it Idiot Royale. Dude even tosses Chishia a piece so he and Arasu can finally hash out that whole you set me up to get killed back at the beach house thing. Legitimately, no one remembers nor cares about at this point. Wait, are you guys seriously going to indulge this freak show? For real, Arasu watched firsthand as his dirtbag brutally assaulted his girlfriend back at the harbor 
and he doesn't even have the nerve to waste him on sight. No, instead, he straight up turns his back as part of some self-sacrificing nonsense he suddenly adopted. Bro, your best friends threw their lives away so you could survive. Are you really gonna piss on their graves by letting this slime ear hole you right now? Fortunately, before Irisu can symbolically throw his gun aside, Usagi shows up in time to remind him what he's fighting for. I almost forgot about you. You just get in the way. Nice one, Gandhi. It's a good thing Chishia was there to throw himself in front of that bullet. That said, she wasn't exactly doing herself any favors, standing there like a deer in the headlights waiting to get popped. There's literally a rusted out car every 15 feet out here. I mean, just moving in general would have made it difficult for him to hit you, one-handing it from a distance like that. Oh, well, no time to worry about it now. It seems all this gunfire got the King of Spades' attention. Lucky for us, these last two blimps drew in plenty of cannon fodder to keep him occupied including all of our surviving friends. Hmm, starting to get a little deja vu. However, unlike before, this time we actually have some firepower of our own. I mean, we're not gonna use it, even when he's literally walking up for the coup de gras. But at least it looks like we've gained something since our first encounter with this psycho. Seriously though, there's a reason solo missions aren't really a thing. It's pure chaos out here. And as good as Mercenary X could possibly be, there's simply no way he could keep from getting blindsided while he's hyper-focused on the panic-stricken players running running all over. Yeah, just like that. Not sure why everyone would be celebrating right now. Has the blimp exploded yet? No, which means he's right about to pull a T-800 and start doing his thing again. Only this time, we get to see his final form. While it seems no one in this universe has ever heard of a double tap, the auto assault did serve as a nice diversion for us to regroup in a nearby building. And look who decided to join the party. Kinda crazy that a Goonie and Akane would both happen to be at this random lobby we held up in. But hey, I won't question it. Now that we've assembled, Literally every single morally good character with both a first name and a heartbeat will need a plan to put the bad guy down for good. And apparently, Erisu's got something. He wants to lure the king to a nearby pharmacy where they'll use a sh ton of aerosol to amplify the effects of Chishia's last remaining soda grenade. I mean, it's creative and all, and I'm sure it'll allow everyone to participate in ways that showcase their respective strengths, but here's the thing. He's just human. He's not invincible. And as for his guns, he won't be able to shoot forever. All three of these statements are facts, and all three of them are reasons this plan is unnecessary and ridiculous. You see that weird gray and black thing Aguni's holding? That's a Howa Type 89, and it gives him the power to take life from farther than five feet away. Sure, he's down to his last magazine, but for the reasons mentioned previously, that's all he's gonna need. While Agent 47 is busy clowning on everyone out there, we just need our buddy here to draw a beat on him while he's preoccupied, and it's over. Depending on what kind of plates he's wearing, the body shot might not do the trick, and it'll be pretty difficult to land a headshot from a distance unless he's standing perfectly still. So our best bet would be to go for the lower torso and upper thigh. No matter how battle-hardened you are, a fractured pelvis is going to ruin everyone's day. As for the king's limited ammunition, he's probably not going to just run out all of a sudden and call a timeout. Instead, he'll probably fall back to resupply and re-engage at a time of his choosing, neither of which we can really predict. When it comes right down to it, the sole objective of his game is for us to take him out. Meaning, if he wants to, he can just hold up in a skyscraper and pull a cold skin until our visas expire. That is to say, luring him anywhere might not work, since he has no real reason to follow us. Least of all, into an enclosed space with the gas pouring out of it. Of course, all this is beside the fact that Erisu's plan hinges on a completely untested weapon that might not even work. Are we really about to stake everyone's lives on a science fair project? I guess so, because here goes a Goonie kicking off the relay for death. I could spend 20 minutes covering all the ways this plane goes to sh but for the sake of time, I'll just whittle it down to the gems. Jesus Christ, someone get this guy a spinoff. Seriously, dude, this homebrew Moab of yours better work, or else literally everyone you care about just died in vain. It's about the time you see five people all more capable than you sprawled out in a pool of their own drippings that you start to think maybe this was a bad idea. Could have just put a goonie in a second story window and we'd all be standing over this guy's scarred up corpse by now. Just saying. Well, it's too late to dwell on it now because the big bad wolf is standing right outside the door. Only problem 
is, he doesn't exactly have to know about you filling the place with a kiloton of Axe body spray to realize this is a trap. I mean, he saw you run in there with a loaded shotgun. All I can say for sure is, thank God he was using a 9mm. Looks like a Goonie wants the platinum chip back. Here's hoping this thing actually works. Throw it! Cool, yeah, that was great and all, but if you had a loaded gun this whole time, why didn't you just put one in the back of the dude's skull when he was standing outside the door? I mean, staking our survival on your ability to perform some top shot sh with a serious head injury seems pretty irresponsible, doesn't it? <laughs> it worked, I guess. Nothing left to do now but scrape up what's left of Usagi and pay the Queen of Hearts a visit. Nah, I'm kidding of course, she's actually fine. Well, she has those stab wounds on her legs, but trust me, she's alright. In fact, literally all of our people are totally fine. Queen is fine, Anne's pretty much dead right now, but she'll be fine. Oh, and Chishia and Crispy, yeah, they're both totally fine. Even Akane's fine, and <laughs> she basically got shot in half lengthwise. Everyone's just fine. Down to their final challenge, Arasu and Usagi scale a nearby building where they find Queen Mira eagerly awaiting their arrival. Gotta admit, he's taken a huge risk bringing someone he cares about into a hearts match, especially the hearts match. Might have been a better idea to go this one alone. This last game is called My God, I Can't Believe They're Really Playing Croquet. The rules are pretty straightforward. Each side gets two balls. To win, you need to put the balls in the... Wait, why am I doing this? The rules are croquet rules. We just have to play three rounds of this absurd game and we're done. We don't even have to win. You just have to complete three little sets of croquet games without withdrawing. If you decide to give up, game over. Uh-oh, I think I'm starting to get it now. There's no possible way it's that simple. It's so simple. Shut up. No, it's not. It couldn't be. Otherwise, someone would have done this already. The fact that she mentions giving up is a major red flag. Why would we give up if this is all it is? There has to be some kind of slow and painful torture involved. You know, besides playing croquet. At the very least, she's just gonna try and drag things out for all eternity. And sure enough, after making it through two sets, Mira suggests they post postpone the final leg to have a tea party. Boy, didn't take long for the other shoe to drop on this one. So obviously the correct answer is no thank you. There was nothing about drinking tea in the rules and anyone with a fist full of brain cells could tell this is where she tries to make us quit. At this point, if demanding we continue isn't enough, I say we immediately resort to violence. Now, in the beginning of the game, Mira said outside weapons were allowed and while she didn't specifically mention how they were to be used, she also didn't say we couldn't blow her head off. However, as Erisu comes to realize, this might not be such a great idea. After all, the only way to clear the game is to complete three sets. That means I would make this game go on forever. If that happens, all the other players are doomed to wait until their visas expire. Well, maybe. The rules did say we have to make it all the way through, but they never said anything about us playing with her. I mean, just look at the setup for this game compared to all the others. No electronic collars or wristbands tracking our every move. Just balls and mallets. For all we know, we can play the last set with Usagi. Fortunately, we don't actually have to waste her to give this a try. If the queen flat out refuses to budge on the issue, I say we tie her up with shoelaces or something and give it a shot on her own. If that doesn't work, well, it's not like she's a bodybuilder or anything. We could probably just force the mallet into her hands and swing for her like an overzealous golf instructor. It's certainly worth a try. Oh, of course, there's one thing I'm forgetting. God Erisu in ma answers. Sure, he might act like he doesn't want to wait, but you just know deep down he's dying to ask her all sorts of questions. Questions she's not going to be able to answer because literally no one here knows anything. That much should be obvious by now. For Christ's sake, dude, just do me a favor and don't drink the tea because that has to be part of her shtick. If it doesn't make you hork up your insides, it'll probably take all your bad thoughts and turn them into good ones. Ultimately, the queen recognizes Erisu's obsession with the truth is the only thing that could slow him down, so she decides to give him exactly what he asked for. It turns out this entire experience has been one giant VR simulation, a video game, if you will. Evidently, in the last thousand years, humanity progressed to the point where all our needs were met except our thirst for adventure, and so the world's population is kept on a continuous dopamine drip by inserting themselves into this world. Crazy, right? <laughs> I'm just joking. Not a word was true. 
You don't say. Man, it's like she has no reason to be truthful with us. And it doesn't stop there. She just keeps puking up plot twists over and over again. Oh, plants took over the world, and aliens are experimenting on us. Oh, you're actually synths being used for high-stakes underground gambling after a nuclear apocalypse. All the while, Erisu's just eating it up until she laughs right in his face and tells him she was lying. So, what do you think happens when she hits him with a solipsism narrative? It's all in your head. Your friends died in a car accident, and you're in a mental hospital. He buys it without question, of course. Man, it's like the invention of lying or something. I refuse to believe this is actually the final boss. This is more like some kind of semi-serious epilogue after the real threat was dealt with. Only thing is, out of everything he's encountered so far, this comes closer to doing him in than anything else. Seriously, if it weren't for Usagi seeing straight through this nonsense and pulling Erisu back from the brink with her burning love, it would all be over. And in the end, after all this, we didn't even have to make the Queen Mira eat her own hair to get back to the game. She's just so moved by the strength of their bond. On. She lets herself get space lasered. Oh god, finally. It's finally over. We beat Croquet. Of course, before we wrap this one up, I guess it's only fitting we share what really happened. After all, you did stick around to the very end. It was a meteor. A meteor hit Tokyo and basically killed everyone that was involved in the games. Those that survived to the end and declined the offer to become citizens ended up coming back to life in the real world. Those that didn't, didn't. So, it was some kind of limbo stage where the dead could fight their way back to life. Or maybe it was all just a crazy dream. I guess that's up to you. In the end, Erisu and all his new friends made it out alive. Well, except for Tata. However, had he taken our advice, he could have probably changed that and spared them all a great deal of suffering in the process. That said, there is one death game I can't quite say we were able to definitively beat without plot armor, and that's the King of Diamonds. As far as I can tell, it's a complete game of chance no matter how you slice it. And for that reason, I think Alice in Borderlands Season 2 was only mostly beat. Moral of the story, if you can't beat them, join them, gain their trust, and then stab them in the back once they depend on you for love and support.